Hello there, my name is Pete Snodden. Welcome to episode two of The Journey. Now, this time around, I chat to a person who I've admired over the years, someone who's been a great inspiration to me for a number of reasons, primarily because he's been so successful and also because he comes from my part of the world, Northern Ireland. He has been on our television screens for 40 years. It's been an incredible journey in terms of his career and his personal life. We, we touch on all of that. We also touch on the fact that at times he can be misunderstood and how that feels and how it frustrates him and also how maybe modern day television frustrates him in comparison to maybe television being made many years ago. I really enjoyed the conversation and I hope you'll get lots out of it whenever you listen. So on the journey this time around, Eamon Holmes. The Journey with Pete Snodden. Eamon, great to see you. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, Peter, for asking me. Um, uh, you're at home at the moment. And um, you know what? You've had the most incredible career. I've grown up watching you on the TV. Um, you have been an inspiration to me on, well, many, many, many occasions over the years. And I want to start with that um, because I remember... Uh, hearing you speak in an interview many, many years ago and you talked about not being put in a box. And you've done a multitude of things in your career from farming to sport to interviewing people in power like prime ministers, doing the lighter side of programming. And um, we'll, we'll get on to how, how that all came about. But as a child growing up, I'm wanting to be on the television has it turned out to be everything that you thought it would be? Oh, goodness, no. No, 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 no. I think it's probably a, uh, in a way, I'm still striving for what I thought it would be um, when I was a viewer. So from that point of view, that that's not necessarily a bad thing because then you always have your hunger, you always have your appetite, you always have a dream, goal, ambition. But um, there's no doubt that to be a broadcaster like you or me is a very privileged thing. It's a very, very privileged thing to be invited into someone's home or car or, you know, on their mobile device or whatever it happens to be. And for someone to actually be interested in what you're saying or what you are conveying. So that's a tremendous privilege and a tremendous responsibility with it. I think all of us think, it's, you know, show business, glamour. It's, it's what I find out is that it's more business than show. And I think if you approach it that way and you approach it as your job, which I've always seen it as my job, it's never been my intention to be famous. It's never, I don't, you know, by consequence of being on telly five days a week for 40 years, yes, you're, you're well known with people, but I don't have as as my critics will point out, I don't have any particular talent or skill. So, you know, I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't even swim. Um, I can't speak a foreign language. There's nothing, I don't have any skill as such, but what I am is I'm a broadcaster. I know how to broadcast. I know how to yeah. listen. Um, and and, and that's, that's my thing. I grew up in, I think, much more naive, much more simple times. So I was a kid in the 60s. And, uh, and then as a teenage in the 70s, the troubles came along and you were very much restricted to your home, very, very much restricted to your home uh, growing up as I did in North Belfast, because if, if you went out, you were going to get into trouble one way or the other. So um, TV was the great escape. And so from the point of view that did it live up to my expectations, there were some lovely, wonderful dreams. My first job in, in 1986 was for a show called Open Air at, uh, at the BBC daytime. And basically it was a three hour version of points of view. And you would go behind the scenes of programs. And Pete, to, to be on the set of Only Fools and Horses or a big Dickensian drama or EastEnders or even Brookside, it was, it was unbelievable because 
you were seeing this on the television and yet you were there you had gone it was like the lion the witch in the wardrobe you went through the wardrobe and you were in this other world and even to this day i get that if you're watching britain's got talent or a program like that and you see these acts on one night and they're voted on or they're voted off whatever happens to them you're watching them as a viewer and the next day on a show like this morning i'll be interviewing them and i've never got over that sort of craziness that that magic box that you look at you can touch people you can step through it you can it's in all our homes and yet the great privilege for someone like me is that i can be there as well be part of it so i've never lost that magic of what tv is and what tv brings and what it can do i've never had any desire to be famous but as a consequence i'm quite well known because i've been on television for five days a week for 40 years so you're in people's psyche and people you know grew up with you or people uh, particularly with breakfast television 26 years of that um people woke up with you so so you're sort of a fixture in in people's lives and it's the surreal thing that becomes real so so when all our, when people are getting up and getting dressed in the morning and brushing their teeth and making their toast and whatever it is and then suddenly they meet Damon Holmes I've got to realize what that's like for them it's not that I'm any I'm special or I have any gift because I've got no gift but, but you know that's it it is it's a tremendous privilege to do what I do and to do what we do do you know what something you just said there um, resonates with I think a lot of people from our part of the world uh, in Northern Ireland is that we uh, we we hide our light under a bushel quite a bit we're quite backwards in terms of coming forward with regards to our talent and whatnot. I mean, you've just been very self-deprecating there about yourself. If you were no good, you wouldn't have been on the television for 40 years. Well, it, it's not, I didn't say I was no good at television. <laughs> I have no other gift. I have no gift whatsoever. I can't sing. I can't dance. I can't even speak a foreign language. I can't cook. I can't believe me. I can't swim. But I, I made it my business. I couldn't be a carpet fitter, which is what my father was and my, my four other brothers could all be if they chose. Two of them are, but uh, they could all have been it. And I always regarded myself as a failure because I couldn't fit carpets to the standard my dad wanted it. So when I found something to latch on to that I thought, actually, I'm not half bad at this, I really was going to take the chance. But the thing about Northern Ireland, Pete, what I'd say about this about us, when you go into everyday life in uh, let, let's take britain and um you look at people who are the head of an orchestra are running a massive um uh, b b b stock exchange listed company um people who are at the heart of government p scientists people from northern ireland we for our population but well above the average, well above the average. And I think it's for two things. One is the excellent education system that we have, unfortunately though, which is there to educate people for export because we just haven't got the jobs or we, we didn't historically have the jobs at home. And the second thing is because perhaps we have, let's say a chip on our shoulder, uh, maybe that's too strong, but we think we're not as good as everybody else, but then we, we realize we are. Because we're, we're wily enough. We, we've got the gift of the gab. We're incredibly great social people. Never, I've never met people like the Irish for being sociable. And, um, and I think we bat well above the average, well above our weight. We fight well above our weight um, for what we do. And I think we're incredibly influential. I think the, the bad thing is the media will only concentrate on highlighting those of us who uh, are in broadcast or you know do films or acting or singing or something like that. But I, I, I never cease to be amazed and be continually proud of Northern Irish people who basically run the country, run the UK. So back in the day, it was, it was different times here. You talk about us being you know educated for export and you left um, Northern Ireland to go to, to England. Well, one thing I get quite a bit is, you know, do you ever think about leaving here? Do you never think about going to England and giving it a go over there? Um, I stayed here, went to Coleraine University because at that time I got the foot in the door at the radio station and I wanted to try and 
you know, use that to my advantage during my university career and, and then try to obviously get a career off the back. But I never felt the need to go. Uh, maybe the opportunity didn't arise. Maybe I didn't push it enough. For you, though, was it, you know, whenever you decided that, that England was the place for you, the opportunities were there, how difficult was it for you to leave here? Very difficult, very difficult. Um, I'm very much a home bird. I didn't want to go, but I realised um, I joined Ulster Television when I was 19. At 21, I was hosting the top programme, Good Evening Ulster, in the country. I had been doing that for five years, and I was top of the tree. I was a big fish in a small pond, and I realised that if I had been doing it, you know, until I was for another five years, and so I'd only be 30, I'd be 30, 31. And it would be probably time for someone else. And I'm thinking, where do you go after that? So I had a chance to leave at 26 and I, and I left. And I'll tell you this, my mother, is not, who is 92, <laughs> said to me only last week, only last week, I said, hi, mom, how are you? And she said, I was just thinking, I was thinking about you. And I've never known, I just want to know why did you go to England? Why did you go over there? And there's really no answer to that, really. Um, but my mother wouldn't see any advantage to me doing what I'm doing in, in the rest of Britain um, uh, compared to staying at home. But then she doesn't understand the industry. She doesn't understand the business. She doesn't understand the lack of programs that are being made. She doesn't understand if it really wasn't for BBC Northern Ireland, there would be very little homegrown television um in in northern ireland and it all changes technology changes the fact that we all have phones now and you can film programs and this and everybody can be a broadcaster on youtube and whatever you've got to was it darwin who said evolve or die so you've got to predict believe me pete i would have stayed in northern ireland i had a brilliant job hosting good evening ulster i you know look you know you know what it's like um, and, and you're treated well and everything was great. But I had no choice. I had to move uh, to develop myself. I had to move for other, other chances. It wasn't easy, but it was the right thing to do. And what were the challenges? You say it wasn't easy. You know, I know it's a long time ago now, but can you remember what the, you know, the, the initial challenges were? Well, the initial challenges were you know, you could do it in Northern Ireland, but could you do it with the big boys, right? So it's like being a footballer and you're playing for Cliftonville or Glen Torren or whatever, you know, can you do it for Man United? Can you do it for Liverpool, whatever? And so you had to prove that to yourself. The other thing, which I never, I don't like to think I got hung up on, was the accent. So many of us from Northern Ireland go to England and we come off with, uh, an American sort of drawl. People talk in a in a way that you know what I mean. Do you know what I mean? You haven't done it yet, so you don't. You don't. You know. But I meet so many people, and they talk, and I think, where are you from? And they go, Call Rain. <laughs> don't talk like that in Call Rain. You know. So I I never had this. Um, what's the word? Uh, I didn't feel inferior about my accent at all. I didn't. I was very proud of Northern Ireland, and I I, I really do feel that if you can do the, the job, whether it is being a teacher, whether it is managing a supermarket, whether it is you know, hosting a breakfast show the way you do, if you can do it at a high level in Northern Ireland, you can do it at a high level anywhere. That's my genuine belief. And what we don't realize is we feel inferior. We do feel inferior, but maybe if you're from Rochdale or Chesterfield or Derby or Plymouth, maybe you feel inferior too. The Scots are a bit like us. The Scots won't be denied. They push themselves very forward. They're very intelligent people. They say it as it is. They're a bit like us. But I think, I think we're a good people. We're a wily people. Um, so there were challenges. And there would have been a certain amount of discrimination. There's always the people, you know, oh, listen to your man talking. Hi now, Brian Kai. You'd, you'd always get a bit of that, you know. Um, but never worried me. Do you think your accent, where you were from, um, did that make you stand out? I mean, you're 40 years in television. You can't say that you've been successful. You've been hugely successful. Do you think coming from here was more of a benefit or more of a hindrance and there was more walls for you to climb over? Well, my friend, 
I think maybe at times there would have been a, um, a push for regional voices. I, I don't know that for sure, but I think the, these things go in waves and, you know, certain times there will be a push for um, uh, women, there will be certain times for certain ethnicities. Maybe when I was there, it was a time for regional accents. And uh, maybe, maybe. Um, and if that was the case, then that probably worked in my, in my favor. But I do think that you have to have a voice that is true to yourself, but it has to be right because if it's too colloquial, it'll not work. It'll not work. So you've got to be realistic about how you talk. So maybe I do have a telephone voice. I'm not overly aware of it, but maybe I do. My, Ruth always says to me, well, which one of your brothers was that on the phone? And I'll say, how do you know that? And she'll say, because you're all talking like that there. Now you're talking. So she thinks that when I talk to anybody back home, I talk um, somewhat differently. But um, yeah, but I do think in terms of my age, my age was, you know, to, to be given Good Evening Ulster at 21 years of age is just like unprecedented. I, I get embarrassed about it now. And I think, why did that happen to me? That was the most amazing stroke of good luck. Um, to be 21, nobody, believe me, nobody gets a regional um, or national TV program, news and current affairs at 21. Nobody does. And um, that was just an amazing thing for me. So it meant by the time I was 26, I was already a veteran in live television terms. And live television is what, is what my skill is, is what I'm known for. That's why I'm hired to, to present live television. So, you know, you mentioned luck there. Yes. And it's amazing the amount of successful people you speak to and they say, oh, I was very lucky. Yes. That, that doesn't 100% wash with me. I, I, I tend to think that you, you create your own luck and it's only if you put yourself out there, you put yourself in the position to get that luck. It's never going to happen for you. So I take your point that you were very lucky to get it. Maybe you feel lucky, but surely you created that opportunity yourself. I think there's two things here that if luck does come your way, it's like being a striker in football or something. If the ball comes to your feet, you've got to be ready to put it in the back of the net. And that's number one. And number two is I tend to be of the belief that the harder you work, the luckier you get. And that's not to say I wouldn't be thankful for strokes of luck that, that came my way. I'll tell you the biggest luck that came my way. When I was at Ulster, well, two, two things I'd say to people. One, people come into broadcast. And you'll see people in the radio station or, or, you know, I'll see people in television. And you'll say, what do you want to do? And they'll say, and they'll look at you blankly and they'll go, um, I was just looking for some advice. What, what do you want to do in broadcast? Do you want to be a camera operator? Do you want to be a floor manager? Do you want to be a sound engineer? Do you want to be a producer? Do you want to be a director? Do you want to be a presenter? Do you want to be a makeup artist? And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what? Yeah, yeah, what? Because most of them want to be presenters, but they're all afraid to say that. And when I did my journalism course at the College of Business Studies in Belfast and my NCTJ course, the lecturer would go around the classroom and say, what do you want to be snodding with? I want to write for the Irish Times. I want to write for the newsletter. I want to write for the Belfast Telegraph, whatever. And they'd get to me and they'd say, well, what do you want to do, Holmes? And I'd say, I want to be on TV. I want to be a reporter on TV. And they would all laugh. <laughs> but a year later, when an opportunity came at Ulster Television, the lecturer phoned me and said, you always said you wanted to be on TV. Well, now's your chance. They're auditioning for farming reporters at Ulster Television. Um, do, you want to, do you want to apply for it? Do you want to put your name forward? And I said, Mrs. Patrick, I, but I don't know anything about farming. I'm city born and bred. And she said, and this is very apt, rule one of journalism, Eamon, find out. And I did find out. And I did my audition against seasoned agricultural reporters. And I got the job. Why did I get the job? Because when the opportunity came to me, 
I was a student of television. There's lots of journalists who are journalists and they can write and they can, you know, they have an expertise or whatever. But I had the technique. That was the difference. And that's always stood by me. There's no point being on TV and, and being a journalist that writes for papers because you write in a different way. In television, you write how you speak. In newspapers, you write how people read. It's a completely different thing. And, and so many people just sort of don't get that or pick up on that. But I had the, I had the technique. Why? Because as a 13-year-old, 14-year-old, 15-year-old, I watched and I studied. I watched the best and I forgot the rest. And I got in the door there. So, well, that probably wasn't luck. That was, you know, that was being prepared. But what was luck, when I got the job, the producer who gave me the job said to me, um, it's a very long story, but I'll make it short to you. And he said to me, um, I said, what's the rate? What's the rate, Mr. Fitzpatrick, what's the rate for the job? And he said, it's the NUJ rate. I said, what's that? He said, 44 pounds, 44 pence. And I said, right, I'm going, right, I'm on, I'm on 3,000 quid at the minute, 3,200, and I'm going, so 44, 44 is 88, 88, 160, multiplied by 10, 1,600, that's less than 2,000 a year. Less than 2,000 a year, and I'm on 3,000. And I said, well, I don't think that's, I don't think the money's great, Mr. Fitzpatrick. I said, is there anything else? He said, you like sport, don't you? I said, yeah, I, really, I love sport. He phoned the sports editor and he said, right, you've got two days on sport as well. You've got weekends on sport. I said, how much is that, Mr. Fitzpatrick? He said, same rate. I thought to myself, right, I may be 19, but I'm not stupid. I'm not coming in here working for nothing. Now, that was, that was a bit stupid anyway. That was stupid thought anyway. So I'm thinking, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I don't think it's enough. And basically he threw me out. He said, young Holmes, I'll say this to you. I've never in all my years here had anybody sit on that seat and refuse a job at Ulster Television, let alone at your age, get out. And he threw me out. And I was walking down and his, his secretary, who was called Ruth, she said to me, what went wrong? I loved you a lot. What went wrong? I said, what went wrong? I said, I'm in here. And, and they think I'm so grateful, I'm gonna work for 44 quid a week. And they, and they think I'm gonna bite their hand off for that. And she said, that's not a week, that's a day. That's the, the NUJ rate. I mean, so, so unreal was the television world to me that I had no idea that 40, you would be paid 44 quid a day. My father wouldn't have been getting paid 44 quid a day, not even remotely. And so suddenly I'd turned down what was gonna be worth about 10 grand a year. So I'm on three grand. I've just turned down a job on a career in TV at, at, uh, at 10 grand. Um, I, I, I went outside UTV. They closed the big security doors behind me. I'm sitting going, what have I done? What have I done? This is just unbelievable. I ran down days before mobile phones. So it's 1980. I run down to the post office in, in Ormo Avenue. And I, um, on the Ormo Road, actually. And I um, phoned, phoned up in the call box. And uh, I asked to speak to Mr. Fitzpatrick again. He's having his lunch. And I said to his secretary, please, will he take the call? And he took the call. And, um, and I sort of, and instead of just saying, I got the, the finances completely wrong. I, I said, I made this thing. I said, I've been thinking about this, Mr. Fitzpatrick. And I think, you know, I work in uh, construction at the minute and for a building magazine, but I think agriculture is the future. I think agriculture is really what I want to do. And I've rethought this and I think you know, you're wrong. I'll work for the money that you're offering. I think that's brilliant. And, uh, you know, whatever, whatever. And there was silence, absolute silence. That was the longest three seconds in my life. And he just said, you start on Monday or you don't start at all. And he put the phone down and that was it. And I had to go and resign from my other job and create a lot of fuss there and whatever it is. Now that was luck. That was luck. You know, you talk about being lucky, and I think, why, why did I get that so wrong? Pete, I swear, I honestly did not believe that anybody could be paid 44 quid a day, plus allowances for that. So that's, so that's, where, that's where it went. That was luck. Whenever you said that, you know, you said in your class you wanted to be a presenter, and everybody laughed at you. Yes, yeah. Um, I, I remember that. I didn't have the... I didn't have the nerve to tell my teachers, my careers teacher, that I wanted to be a radio presenter. I didn't have the nerve. I, I, I got bullied. I got bullied in a point for, for saying that that's what I wanted to do. No, but, but my point, my point is to anybody, no matter what your what it is in life that you want to be, when when the opportunity comes up and they give it to someone else, and you'll say, why didn't they get? Why didn't they give it to me? Because you didn't let them know. You have to let them know. That's what I'm saying. 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and that's something that, that I've passed on and something back then I've learned an awful lot from, from whenever I was a kid, because actually those people who said you couldn't do it pushed me on to prove them wrong. And, uh, and for them, I will always be for, forever thankful. The money thing's really interesting um, for me. I remember many years ago um, hearing you speak about doing breakfast television and how you were finished in the morning at nine o'clock and then it gave you the rest of the day for lots of other opportunities. Yeah. yeah. Um, for you, was it the money? Was it just being on the television? Was it a mixture of both? What was the, the biggest driving force for you in your career? I love broadcast I, and, I, and I have, I mean, it's been my strength and been my weakness that I am incredibly versatile. So you name a subject, records behind you there, movies, cars, um, you know, explorers, history, crime, you know, I would say, yeah, 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 yeah. I have an interest in all those. And I've always been educated via telly, I presume. Even when I was at school at St. Malachy's College doing my A-levels and O-levels, um, people would read textbooks. Um, I would go and watch Horizons and World in Actions, and I'd find out about tectonic plates and volcanoes and all sorts of things and have a different angle. So it was more impressive when the teachers read where did he get that idea from? Where did he get that theory from? Where did he get that supplementary knowledge from? I was beyond the textbooks and I could see television as a great educator. A lot of people, you know, see television as dumbing you down and that is very true. And I think particularly nowadays, but in the seventies and eighties, there were, there was great education to be had. There's education still to be had if you look for it on the right channels, history channel yesterday, you know, national geographic, whatever it happens to be. There's, there's, education to be had. So I, I always felt that um, I, I could benefit and, and, and progress from, from watching television. So, so yeah, that was me. You say, you know, particularly nowadays, television in a sense can, can be dumped you down. Yeah. I sense a bit of frustration there. Are you frustrated by, by what? Oh, I tell you what, television by and large is made by privileged, educated people who treat, and I speak as a working class person, right? It's run from, by people from Oxford and Cambridge and whatever. And their attitude about ratings is to give people competitions, which you enter and you pay £1.54. And the question is, you know, does Donald Trump live in A, the Blue House, B, the Black House, or C, the White House? And they call that aspirational television. Now, what makes me frustrated about that is when I grew up on the New Lodge Road or the old Park Road in, in Belfast, my aspirational television was watching Horizon, World in Action, Blue Peter, Panorama, whatever. And I would, I would watch Blue Peter and I would learn about Captain Cook and I would learn about travel and I'd learn about Admiral Nelson and I'd learn about all sorts of things. I would just learn and I would soak, soak this up. That's aspirational television, not, not bingo channels and all sorts of things that, that, that go on now. So in a way, I suppose me being me and how I was educated and what I received from television, the idea that all people are stupid and have low attention spans and don't want to see documentaries on TV um, and can't question for themselves it's very, very strange to me. It's, it's just sad. You know, it's sad that we just don't get, we get the same mix, the same diet of programs every week on the same nights. You can tell exactly what happens. You know, more soaps, more talent shows, more reality shows. And indeed, to be a presenter nowadays, you, they really aren't interested in, they're really not interested, Pete, in someone like you with your background in education and experience that you've got going on to national television. Because it's not about whether you can do the job. It's about how many people follow you on Instagram. How do they know you? How many magazines have you been in? And, and that's why when people say they want to be famous, they probably will be famous, but they'll be famous for two years or three years or four years. And that's the end of it. For most of them, they'll probably make a lot of money, but that is the end of it. If you want to last, if you want to have a career, um, it's different, but it's not about being on the front cover of a magazine, I suppose. It's, it's just about 
it's hard to get on the conveyor belt, but it's harder to stay there, to reinvent yourself, to use that Darwinian um, phrase again, evolve or die. You talked earlier about being in the magic box and coming into people's yeah. uh, living rooms. For me, being on the radio is coming to people's cars or their kitchens or their bathrooms, wherever they're listening right now. And you say it's a privilege and it is a privilege. And the one thing, certainly in radio terms with what I do is that I'm given four hours a day, along with my team, um, to to build a persona and build a relationship with the audience, and they trust you, and they 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 come and they make you part of your day, and it's a huge privilege. And um, with television, how when there's more constraints and more production and more things fired at you that perhaps maybe you don't want to do but you have to do, how how did you go and how did you set about creating that relationship with the audience so they would? They would allow you into their world and they would trust you. Well, I think for me, if it went wrong, I would say it's gone wrong. I, was, I, I, I enjoy it going wrong, actually. I can't, I can't stand seeing live programs that look pre-recorded. I think, what's the point? I used to argue with producers all the time. I said, what is the point of doing this live if it looks recorded? You know, live's got to look like, the, the audience got to be on the edge of the seat. They've got to think, oh, anything can happen. I don't know if this is going to go right, wrong, whatever. But you've got to be confident enough in your own abilities that you're like the pilot of a plane or the surgeon in an operation or whatever, that if it goes wrong, you're the guy you want to take you through turbulence or to stop the bleed or whatever it happens to be. And that's the way I sort of see see myself. But um, it's, a, it's a funny thing. The thing about live television, of course, is you're only one slip, one one word, one sentence away from the sack because uh, people, people probably, they probably like predictability. They probably, a lot of them who, who don't know me, I don't know who I am, even after all these years. And, you know, often when there are holidays and people are watching daytime TV, they're not used to my style. They're not used to the way I react to things. And what's this about? What did he just say? You, you know, so, so it, it is a, it's a strange thing, but look, it's, I, I would get bored. If I wasn't doing live TV, I would get so bored. I get so bored with people who rehearse, 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 and look as if they've just rehearsed, you know, I just, it just, it just puts my light out really. I mean, I fly by the seat of my pants. It's not to say I'm not prepared. People often make that mistake. I've heard people in the past, you know, other presenters say, oh, Eamon Holmes, he doesn't prepare doesn't prepare, doesn't just, Eamon Holmes is always prepared. Eamon Holmes watches everything, listens to everything, knows everything about what's going on. And, you know, for people who, who, who like to believe, oh, he's gaff prone or he made a gaff, I don't do gaffs. I don't do gaffs. I just, you know, I say things that other people won't say. That's a different, that's a different thing. That may be your taste. That may not be your taste. You just try and be honest. You try and um, be real. I always think if I was watching this at home, would I, would I be happy with what I'm seeing or how this is being explained to me? And that's the way I've always been a viewer. I've never been in that situation where I think I know best. But it is, it's a crazy life where you put yourself up to be judged all the time. You know, what you do, what I do, people, everybody has an opinion on it. And, and, and some people wake up first thing in the morning wanting to be offended, wanting you to lose your job, wanting to report you to Ofcom because that's their mission in, in life. And, and, and that has happened to you in so many times. So many and I've never been found guilty of anything. I just like to say, <laughs> right, no matter but, what, it's, many times it's happened. People have called for your head. You know, people yeah. have criticized you in the written press. And now online, I mean, you put yourself on Twitter, you put yourself on Instagram, whatever it is. It, it just takes a keyboard warrior to say whatever it is. How do you deal with that? Well, I tell you what, mate, up until about 10 years ago, or less, five, six years ago, I genuinely thought most people like me. I thought most people <laughs> never, I've never had any angerness, any horribleness, whatever. Um, but then social media came along and you think, whoa, whoa, just by breathing, you offend them. So I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, part of what you do um, to, to annoy people or critics is, is just by remaining there, by staying there, whatever they try and do to get rid of you. It doesn't seem to happen because luckily if more people like you than and dislike you, then that's all you can do. But I'm I'm an honest bloke. I play I uh, you know ply an honest trade. That's what I that's what I try to do. 
I love what I do. I would love to um, do different areas, but ever since I was young, they want to put you in a box. And I always had heroes like, you know, Des Lynam or David Coleman or, you know, Frank Both and, and people who, these great anchors that we had on television and, um, you know, people like Frost and Parkinson, they could do interviews with world leaders and then they could do quiz shows and game shows. And why not? The audience follow that. But um, nowadays, it appears you can't do a history program unless you're an historian. You know, you can't do, uh, I don't know, you have, to be, you have to be an expert. You can't do a program about the sewers of Belfast unless you've built the sewers, you know. With, it's, I mean, it's a nonsense. You can be a genuine uh, enthusiast or have an inquiring mind. For instance, I don't believe that all football programs should be presented by footballers. You know, I think that's a nonsense as well. I do think that you should have a fan's perspective. You should have, you should have, you know, the way I grew up with, with people who were, were journalists or broadcasters, but could ask the questions. Footballers don't ask each other the questions. It's just a chums club, right? It's fine. I get on, I watch it all, listen. But I don't believe that, you know, to commentate on a certain sport or to uh, present a certain sport, there's a difference. Um, you have to be affiliated to that sport. So times have changed because for so long you weren't put in a box. You were doing magazine programming. You were doing yes, special stuff. You were doing game shows. You were doing Jet Set on a Saturday night. You were doing National Lottery. I mean, even in more recent times, you were doing the, the, the Lifestyles and Rich and Famous program on Channel 5. You, you had all that good stuff going on. Now, with those opportunities in terms of your journey, were you going and wrapping the door or was the door being opened to you and they were saying, come on in? Well, I've been very lucky in life that um, probably, you know, 95%, well, more than that, most jobs come to me. Um, but I think now we, if you have to go out and sell yourself at my age and stage, um, it's like a lot of people are, well, what, what, what do you do? What, why, well, why would you do sport? I don't really understand why you do sport, you know? And then I just look at people and I think, well, you haven't done your homework. You don't know what I used to do. You don't know, you know, that I worked for BBC Sport or, you know, I worked for ITV Sport as well. Um, you know, there, there's just things, people don't know you've done quiz shows and game shows. And I just think that reflects more on them. Sort of, I suppose, what frustrates me is when you come up against executives, who don't live and breathe television. They could be selling baked beans, they could be working in insurance, they could be doing anything. They don't have that same passion for broadcast. I think having a passion for broadcast is, is a great thing. And it's the same as if you're a teacher or a police officer or whatever, and you have a passion for what you do. It must be very stifling when you come up against um, the bureaucracy or the people who were never really good enough to to do it at your end and they end up rising to the top and whatever, whatever it happens to be. Do you know, funny, funny, um, I'm sitting talking here, but and before I came out, come out to talk to you, I, 15 years ago, I wrote that book, right? That, that's, that's my autobiography. And I just I thought to myself, because sometimes you, you were talking about the journey and there's, there's two pages at the end of this, which is, I, I call what makes me me. And, and I read them before I came on, this morning to talk to you and if you bear with me Pete I, I think very little of it has actually changed and I and I talk about my life and I say um, so that was my life so far bear in mind I was 44 then and and it's as best as I can remember it it's not meant to be held up as better or worse than anybody else's life but it's mine and it's what makes me me um, I have lived 46 years, yeah, 25 of them on the telly, got married, got divorced, been a father four times and seen 30 years of civil disturbances in my homeland of Northern Ireland, which was a massive effect on, on who I am and what I turned out to do as a career. But you can't go through all of this without learning a few things. I've learned that we're all products of our environment and the parents who raise us, but however good or bad, don't be limited by either. Take what is positive and use it to find your own place in the world. Now, if I had a weakness, I would say I'm incredibly sentimental and I'm incredibly um, influenced by my, my family. My father has passed away 30 years or so now. Um, my mother's still alive. But sometimes I kick myself up about how 
sentimental I am. And, um, but what it does, the, the positive is, means I'm very proud of Northern Ireland. There's a lot of things I don't know, but I do know that I am a Belfast man first and foremost. And I can identify with that. And I hope I will always be grounded like that. I've learned that the world can be a viciously cruel place, but the important thing is not to dwell on the punches that knock you down, but to put your energy into getting back up again. Now, all this business where we're all supposed to hug each other and, um, and, and be kind to each other, whatever, that's brilliant. And it's absolutely, absolutely brilliant. And I'm, I'm all for that. But my worry, and you're a parent, Pete, you tell me, my worry is if we make, if we wrap our kids in cotton wool like this and say everybody's nice and everybody's lovely, they will find out when they're made redundant, when they're passed over for promotion, when someone is awful to them at work because bullying exists out there. They'll be, surely we have a duty to make them realize that there are some bad people out there in all sorts of ways. Do you worry about that with your with your kids? How you? I, I do. I worry about that with my kids. Um, they grew up in a very loving environment. I'll give them the shirt off my back in the same way as my parents would give me the shirt off their back, um, and uh, and I want them to really enjoy their childhood in the same way as I grew up in a very loving home, and they will have all the love that myself and my wife can give them. Um, but I also want them to be streetwise, and I want them to be resilient, and I want them I want them to have confidence. But you know. Confidence with a small C, yeah, yeah. I think it's a great thing. I don't want them to be to be cocky. I want them to treat everybody uh, with the way they would want to be treated, and that, those are the sort of values that were instilled in me whenever I was growing up. And I never understood. I grew up in Bangor. I, I went to school in Belfast, and I got the train every day to and from school. But um, my my parents always said to me, you know, that our front door is always open. Our front door is always open, and I never understood what that what that meant growing up as a child. Um, and, and they were they were giving me the values that you know you treat everybody the same doesn't matter who you are doesn't matter where you're from doesn't matter what your religion your yeah. creed is, doesn't matter you're welcome in our home and yeah. they're the same values as I and my wife give to our kids and that's the way we want them to 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 live their lives but they've got to go through some tough times too in order yeah. to to learn that and and we just have to face that but yeah, I don't I don't care in this in this world in which we live now where everything is so you know everyone's giving hugs as you say and being nicey nicey kids can still be cruel to one another my eldest is nine no, and i can still see yeah. some of that not even coming through even at that but, young age but, but what i would say is people seem to think bullying is a childhood thing it's not it goes right on right through the workplace and and beyond and there's no point complaining about everything it's just knowing to be able to stand up to it i would say i'd also say something here that jumped out at me especially doing the job that i do a lot of people, I wrote this, and I think this, is, this stands true. I've learned that true wisdom comes from listening and be able to do so as a reflection of a confident person. You use that word confidence there. And listening, the amount of interviewers on TV that don't listen, don't listen. So I like to think, I listen. I've learned to treat others as I would wish to be treated, but I've also learned that when they don't be prepared to stand up to them, that's the Belfast boy in me. I've learned it's why pra wise practice in today's world to work for yourself rather than anyone else. Not sure that applies now. I used to think, I used to think um, you know, be self-employed, be independent. But then I realized governments don't want you to be self-employed or independent. Go governments that say they're friends of small businesses, it's all nonsense. It's all nonsense. They want us all taxed to the highest level, and they need to be, especially under this um, this terrible emergency at the moment. So I think times will change. So I think that advice probably has changed. Um, I've learned I need heroes to look up to or to escape with at the movies or on the sports field. And I do think even if our heroes don't live up to who we think we are, it's nice to dream, isn't it? It's nice to have heroes. Oh, I've heroes. Got Oh yeah, I've got my heroes. They're on the yeah. football, they're on the rugby pitch, they're on the television, they're on the radio. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I learned early on that there only is one Eamon Holmes. There only is <laughs> one Stephen Gerrard. There only is one. And, and, and I remember whenever I was coming into broadcasting, um, I, I felt maybe I need to sound like this person or that person. I very quickly realized that I just need to be me. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, another thing jumped out to me here is I've learned that friends like you to be successful, but not too successful. <laughs> I think that is, I think that is something in life 
whereby maybe explains a lot goes on social media as well. I'm the sort of person genuinely because I came from not much, but really hardworking family with really good morals and principles. And, and like your parents instilled in you, or you're instilling in your children. That's sort of what I've tried to be. I think I'm a good person. And I think I've, I've always been brought up to do the right thing or as close to it as possible. But um, I, I, I do think, um, what was that? What was I going to say there about that? That was, uh, Oh yes, successful, friends being successful. But genuinely, I think that people <laughs> people are happy for your success as long as it's not um, better than theirs, really. I think, <laughs> I think so. And you've got to be very careful. I think you've got to be very careful how you handle success. And I don't know if I've handled it well throughout the years in, in terms of maybe, you know, maybe I bought too big a car. Maybe I lived in too big a house. Maybe I flaunted that I was earning a few quid. Maybe it annoyed people. Maybe, but I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to. But, um, you know, I was suddenly, you know, going from earning, you know, 10 quid a day to 44 quid a day. And, um, and that changed my life. And, you know, to then ha be earning more money than my dad would have had. In, in his life or his, you know, he wouldn't have been earning that in a year for doing much harder work. It's always made me feel very humble that I actually don't do a real job. Well, it's not real work. So no one has to tell me when people come on social media and say, what do you do? What do you do? Just talk to people, you know, whatever. I think, yeah, I know, I know, I know what I do. I know I'm very lucky, you know, but I try and do it well. The purpose of this this podcast and talking about your journey yeah we focus an awful lot on on your career and what you do on the television and i've got a few final questions about that coming up but a big part of your journey is is your life away from uh, the tv so whether that's passions like sport and following manchester united but 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 at home your wife ruth um your family your children you know if, looking at, at how you have been a father and particularly whenever you moved away from here um, and kids being here, you being over there, you know, how difficult was that for you? And, and personally, do you think you've done an all right job? Oh God, you, you would have to ask my children um, on that one, but I, I don't think you'd have any complaints, but um, I, to this day, uh, bear in mind, I, 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 my, my first son was born in Manchester and then uh, I lost my job, which is like, it's like being a footballer. You, you know, it's so intransigent, you know, your job can be there and taken away from you. I thought I'd live in Manchester for the rest of my life, really, because it was all going so well. But then you realize TV execs, you, they, they change jobs. They want the budgets for certain programs. They take them. They take those budgets. They don't care if they're ruining your life or whatever. That's the way it goes. So, um, I would, to this day, the stretch of water, um, you know, the Irish Channel between uh, between England and and uh, Belfast, is, is 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 an eternity for me. I mean, I often think if I if my family were in Leeds or in Glasgow or you know Norwich or whatever, I could jump on a train or I could drive. No matter how many hours it took, I could always be there in the same day. But there's sometimes uh, whether it's weather, whether it's strikes, whether it's you know the present condition. Um, it's not as easy to get back to, to Belfast and you just can't pop right and see people. And things like this Zoom has made my life uh, superb. I mean, we've got my 18 year old son, he lives in this house, but I never see him until we do Zooms. You know, he lives, he lives over the garage somewhere. He has, you know, he's a den up there. And so I've got Declan, Rebecca, Niall on, and they're, they're Declan's wife and Rebecca's boyfriend, whatever, they're all, they're all join up. And then suddenly Jack pops up and I think, oh, yes, I remember you. So funny, the one that lives with you, um, you, you have to wait till, till you see him on Zoom. But we're, we're, very, we're a very close family um, and uh, you know, I make no bones of it. I would, I would live in Belfast again tomorrow. I still have a home in Belfast and um, I, you know, if I could, I, I would. Uh, that's where I would be. That's where I intend to, to end up. Um, but um, I've never really, I've never really gone away. But gosh, I miss. I've, 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 I've lived in a continual state of homesickness since I left in 1986. That without a doubt, without a doubt. What's the feeling like for you whenever you get off the plane at George Best Belfast City Airport? Oh yeah, a lot. 
first thing I do is I look at the cave hill. I look at the cave hill. You see the Harlem Wolf Cranes. I see the um, the cave hill, and the cave hill is something that has great um, sentimentality for me and lovely memories. And um, uh, you know, funny, I get quite jealous. I was talking to my brother last night, one of my brothers, and uh, he was saying to me, "Oh, I did this walk up over the cave hill? I did this." And I was really jealous listening to him. He says, "I'll go up there every day. I do this. I do that and during lockdown." And and I'm thinking. Um, you know, there's just, there's just, there's just little things. Lockdown's been very interesting because it's taken. I mean, I've been quite busy during lockdown. You know, whether it's doing something like this or um, various podcasts and video casts of my own, or you know, some some programs are even transmitted from our from our house. Um, and we still work on this morning. It has to be said. Um, but I do think that the idea of thinking about uh, you know, pre-retirement, not retirement, but pre-retirement, you know, winding down, doing less, living more. You know, my, my father was um, was dead at 64. You know, he died of a heart attack. And I sort of think to myself, well, that gives me four years. I shouldn't think like that. Ruth keeps telling me, stop thinking like that. But you sort of do think like that. But, um, yeah. So you mentioned Ruth. You're great on television together. Um, you know, you, you nitpick at each other. It's all part of it. Um, what's it like working with your wife? What's it like coming off the back of a show that maybe hasn't gone so well or maybe not the way in which you had hoped it would go and then going back to your dressing room, then bringing that home with you in the evening? Is that difficult? Um, yes, because Ruth doesn't talk work. So she's not, it's not an ideal situation because I would talk work morning, noon and night and like to talk work. Um, Ruth doesn't, Ruth, um, as we speak, has got her hair bunched up and um, she's mopping the floor in the kitchen and she loves being domesticated and she is, uh, she, I've never seen anybody with the energy that she has and, you know, she's always designing clothes for a QVC range and, but, you know, that that seems to be her, her passion, uh, this um, fashion designing that she's been doing for three years and, um, uh, but we, we're, we're different, we're different sort of, we're different sort of people. You see, the interesting thing is, Ruthie was brought up as an army child, so she lived in various bases around the world. She's, she's in Libya and Malta and Singapore and all these places, and um, they didn't have TV. So <laughs> she's no reference point. So when I talk, we're the same age, but when I talk about certain programs you grew up with and whatever, she's like blank, doesn't know what it's about. So we come at it for, from, um, from different um, uh, directions. Um, uh, you know, she's a fantastic broadcaster. She's very, very good, but she is, um, she's no, nobody's full, nobody's pushover. She's, um, she's the boss in this relationship. So there you go. That's, that's it, you know. So she's the boss. How do you take criticism from her? Well, she always criticizes me. Yeah. She would, she would always criticize me. Um, so I usually just say, Oh, give it a rest, you know, <laughs> we're too different. She will say, she will say she reins me back and I will say that I uh, encourage her to be more free and, uh, you know, more open about things, but there's no doubt about it. We don't rehearse anything. If we have a humor, uh, I'm very thankful that uh, most people in Northern Ireland sort of get the banter and um and ruth's you know ruth enjoys the the banter um but there's some people i think particularly younger people if you ever get complaints they're younger people 2021 20, um i can't believe the way you spoke to your wife or whatever <laughs> believe me ruthie's the boss ruthie's the one in charge um and that's the way that's the way it goes but there is there is the relationship i mean it's all it's 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 natural it's not worked at um but I don't see Ruth's not the sort of person that would want to make TV the be all and end all of her life. You know, she's much more happy being at home. She is a complete domestic goddess. Um, she loves being a mother. She, you know, she loves walking the dog. She loves, you know, so I don't know. She, she packs so much into it. I have nothing but admiration for her, nothing but admiration, but we're, we're different people. We just happen to be married <laughs> and, <laughs> and present TV together. <laughs> You've, you've done so many shows, um, all different types um, yeah. of television. In terms of your persona and how you're viewed, you know, whenever the likes of 
Keith Lemon's Celebrity Juice came along. Yeah. All yes, right. Yes, yes. And you're you're known for doing Sky News in the morning, GMTV, um, uh, this morning, and then you're on doing that type of programming. Yes. Were you were you worried about that at the start? Um, I'm worried about it at the end. Um, I do think that um, you know maybe maybe um, you know maybe we shouldn't be doing that sort of thing anymore. Maybe maybe you know it's. Uh, it's, but he, do you know what? He's such a nice man. Um, he is filthy. He's completely filthy, which I constantly tell him on air and whatever. But um, it's it, it's a sort of thing. It opens you up to a new audience, you know, um, a different audience, a younger audience, an evening time audience. And um, so, from that point of view, it's 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 good. But Keith Lemon, there's a lot of people who are quite evil and nasty with their humor or whatever. He's not, he's just filthy, he's filthy, but he's, he's, he's very kind. He's very, very nice man. Um, yeah. Um, so therefore you sort of do it because he's a mate really, you know, do you if, not think I should do it? Do you not think, do you, do you think you should do it? No, can I, can I be honest with you? I, I, mm. I've had some of, I mean, I have laughed my leg off at so much of that program. I yeah, really, I really have. How, how he's you know kept it going for as long? It's all him. it's all him. It, the energy the energy from him things that aren't even funny, uh, he will make them funny. He's he's a genius. Going forward, then mm -hmm. you, you mentioned retirement or pre-retirement. Do you ever think Eamon Holmes will fully retire? Because watching you over the years knowing you in the small way in which I do, you are, in my opinion, addicted to your work. It's a massive part of your life. It's, I'm addicted to my work and it's, 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 it's fundamentally, I suppose, to a point who I am. It's, it plays a massive part. If, if it was all to go tomorrow, I mean, number one, would you want it to, if you know, financially secure, would you want it all to go? Would you make that decision yourself to finish it? Or do you think you will always dip your toe in it in some shape or form? Well, it is a, it's a vocation. Um, I, I definitely think that um, for me, um, uh, and, I, and I do genuinely, you know, there's projects that I would crave and I've got great interests in, in lots of things. I think the art of conversation, I think the wonderful thing about Ireland is that Ireland loves talk and conversation. And particularly when you look at RTE um, and, and, and shows like The Late Shoes and the various talk shows that they have, they're not like a lot of the shows that you have in England, which is just about, you never learn about the film that the star's in. It's just all, you know, gimmicky, jokey sort of stuff. And, and, and the idea that there's no serious conversations with movie stars and things, I, I find rather strange I, and, and I, think, I think I find that sad for society that, that we don't sit with leaders of industry or politicians or whatever it happens to be and you can make those, you can, our duty, my duty, the sort of broadcaster I am, is to inform, to educate and to entertain. That is, that is what I'm there for, not to bore the pants of people, not to do things in a bland way, but to do them to the best of your ability and let people know. I mean, I always thought breakfast television was a tremendous privilege because people would wake up my duty was and I would always say this to the producers and the editors what are they learning this morning that they didn't know when they went to bed last night basically there's no point regurgitating the six o'clock or the ten o'clock news at 6 a.m in the morning it's what has happened in Australia what has happened in America what has happened somewhere that they didn't know about uh, when they went to bed last night and that's we're, we're there to provide a service. You're not there to go through the motions. Um, so yes, there are things that I would, I would like to do. I'd like to do biopics on people. There are things that I sort of regret and I miss. And, you know, Doris Day died. And I thought, why did I not interview her? Why did I not interview Kirk Douglas? Well, I'd like to interview Clint Eastwood. You know, there, there's various people that I would, I'd like to have on a, on a bucket list and um, uh, to, to talk to, because I think these people um, categorize times, they are part of history. I think anybody who's eminent or preeminent, they deserve a chat, they deserve, deserve to be recorded, and hope I'm not one of them, you know, before they corpse it. 
Um, so listen, yes, there's lots of things. Would I ever retire? It's like, it's like everything else. Um, it's financial security. It's uh, as long as you have your health. What we've learned during this coronavirus situation is our health is our wealth. That is what it's about. And hopefully we all emerge as better, nicer, kinder people. And I'm a bit of a no-nonsense person. And I would be very bad in politics because I would be basically, you know, I'd be looking at, you know, situations uh, in politics, particularly in Northern Ireland. And I'd be saying, really? Really? Is this really what we should be debating? Not We should be debating the state of the health service, the state of the roads, there should be the state of care homes, the state of whatever. The, we should be talking about the really important things in life, not about ideological things or, you know, things that may or may not happen. And I, I sort of yearn for real, as I would call it, real politics, real politics. But I'd be useless in politics. I'd be absolutely useless in, in politics because I couldn't belong to a political party. I just couldn't. I couldn't toe the line. I couldn't be, I'd have to be an independent um, on something. But I do admire, I do admire, and I, I, I am familiar and friendly with a lot of politicians through um, what goes on at Westminster in particular and um, my work on, on talk radio and I've spent a lot of time getting to know a lot of politicians and no matter what their color or creed is, um, they all care, they all care. It's just, um, you know, when in Northern Ireland are we actually gonna move on and give people, real people, real politics? Um, I am cautious at time. So I've got a couple more questions. And the, the radio versus television. I mean, you grew up wanting to be on the telly. I grew up wanting to be on the radio. I always say, if a TV gig comes along, I'm not going to go, now nah, you're all right, thanks. Um, uh, you, you've, you've been on Five Live. You've been on Radio 2. You've been on Magic. You've been on Talk Radio. You know, you've, you've, you've been around. Do, do you enjoy it as much as television? I enjoy the conversations because the conversations are, are longer. And one of the things I'm... I'm doing now is I'm trying to develop a YouTube channel where at the minute I'm talking to football managers, Eamon, Eamon meets the gaffers and I've very been, good by the way. Thank you very much. But I, I could extend that to lots of other people because I just like you enjoy talking. The thing is, do people enjoy listening? You and I talking here. Um, do people listen beyond three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes? You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. But um, I enjoy conversation. I think we, as a people, enjoy conversation. And, and we're all the same. We're sort of nosy, where we care. Um, and we have, we have humor. We have great humor. It's amazing. It's amazing the amount of people who can't really understand when you throw a bit of humor into, into something, why you would, why you would do that. Um, but... <laughs> You know, I, I, I do get into terrible trouble about things, but I think, what are you talking about? When Philip Schofield came out um, uh, on uh, this morning and everybody's crying and everything's all so horrible and awful and whatever it is. And I thought, well, I'll just lighten the mood here. And I said, well, that explains a lot. And he said, what? And I said, well, that explains why I used to say to Ruth, how does he get away with being in a hot tub with Kelly or Holly Willerby? I, you wouldn't let me do that, you see? And everybody starts, I said, now we know, now we know. Uh, and um, and everybody starts laughing, but the amount of people who wanted to be offended that he he was appreciative, you know, he was appreciative, but that was very much the Irish humour, the Irish banter, the Irish doesn't mean you don't care, doesn't mean to say it, it just means that you're saying there are more important things in life to worry about. Being misunderstood, mm -hmm. which yeah. which in essence is what you are sometimes. Yes. Um, you deal with it very well, and certainly from what you've said to me today, you, you seem to deal with it quite well, but it must frustrate the heck out of you, having to justify yourself. Yeah, but you see, it's like, already we'll sit here with this uh, podcast of yours, and um, the, the, the journalism, which I never uh, thought that, that I would do or want to do and um, my son's probably going to be a journalist and I will and I will say to him son really is this it is this what you want to do is to clickbait is to pick the most sensationalist thing that I've said today and twist it and turn it around uh, and create a headline that has nothing to do with the story 
Um, print is a very cruel and a very cold uh, form of communication. Humor is often not communicated in, in print. Um, and sometimes that's why I'm more a fan of broadcast radio or, or television as a result of that. But that is the way life is. That is the way uh, things are. And you've just got to accept that that's uh, clickbait. And then that plays into the hands of people like Donald Trump, who will thump the drum on what he terms fake news. And sometimes as a profession, we have nobody to blame but ourselves. Throughout your journey, if you could do it again, would you do it the same? Would you do anything different? It's been, I mean, as Eric Cantona said uh, when he left Manchester United, it has been a beautiful journey. Um, there's nothing much when you, you know, when you think about it to, to get a job as a reporter on Ulster Television at 19, anchor the Tea Time programme at 21, uh, at 25, 26, be poached by daytime TV in England for a network programme, Open Air, to be then uh, invited to present the holiday programme for BBC One in the evening, then with that, to become a sports reporter doing snooker and all sorts of things, tennis for the BBC and uh, BBC Breakfast News, to then be poached by ITV when they're starting up a new um, breakfast franchise um, to host that and be involved in breakfast television for 26 years through to Sky News, to host Saturday Night Entertainment from theatres that as a kid I used to watch Scylla Black, Cliff Richard, Val Dunigan come from and now I was in doing the same sort of thing, to be awarded the OBE for services to, to broadcasting. Why would I want to do it any differently, really? It was, you know, when I look back at it, I suppose I've got to give myself, much and all as it may annoy a lot of people, um, I am humbled, I am proud. I think I haven't done bad for a lad from North Belfast. And North Belfast is somewhere where I, I continue to have a, an incredible interest with the, the suicide rates amongst young men in North Belfast is the highest in Europe. And I am product of North Belfast and I say why not me why not me and I've sat down with with people who are involved in in trying to curb this and understand this and we talk about the role models and and for someone like me maybe it was a stable family environment it was getting a job early it was having a goal it was having an ambition it was having role models it was various things and and these are things that I would be passionate about changing passionate about realizing how lucky we used the term we started out about the journey uh, Pete then we were saying how much of the journey is luck <sighs> you know I didn't choose my parents you know I didn't choose the school that I went to these things were chosen for me and sometimes I got to think is someone looking after you and not looking after other people how much of it is luck how much of it can we change but I think as, as Cantona said it's been a a beautiful journey and I feel I feel blessed I feel blessed Eamon it's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you I could uh, take up another few hours of your time I'm not going to do that but just thanks for being too open honest you're like that on television um, and I think that's that is part of the reason why you've been hugely successful you have the Irish wit you've got the humor you're a brilliant uh, journalist you know how to ask the right questions you also can tell it as we are seeing it whilst we're watching the magic box in the corner. And for that, um, I thank you. I thank you for uh, inspiring a whole host of journalists, potential uh, presenters in television and radio. Um, and you know what, in your career, uh, besides what you've done the TV, um, you, have, uh, you have led a lot of people into this media world, which for those of us lucky enough to get into it, um, it's a brilliant place to be. As I always say, Pete, it beats working for a living, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you very much.